Hi, I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at the Tabernacle, and it's so good to have you with us today. We are so glad that you're joining us online. Obviously, we'd like to see you face to face. If you live so far away that you can't come here, we encourage you to join a local church in your community to serve God there. We really pray that you enjoy the video today and may God bless you. And may you learn much from these videos that we offer. Thanks again for joining us. Good morning, Tabernacle. My name is John, and I'm just a servant of Jesus Christ. And I am glad that you've chosen to start out 2024 with us. Uh, I was on the phone last night with uh, Britton Bishop, and uh, he sends his greetings to you, and especially to Manistee. They're his favorites. Um, he does not send his greetings to Adam Sharp. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But to everyone else, you have been greeted by Britton Bishop. There's some exciting things going on uh, with our church uh, that I want you to be aware of. Uh, some of you, well, most of us are aware that um, in about a month, we'll be opening our Cadillac campus. Uh, so, keep your, yeah, so keep your ear to the ground for that. We're excited. Um, so... Uh, and, and people are always offended by this because um, I don't know why. But I'm excited because then we'll have a place to sit. Here, at least here in Buckley. Y'all can just, no, just kidding, all right? Don't be offended, all right? Second thing is, uh, please, those of you that are in our database and you get um, our Tab Insiders, be watching your email this week. Uh, there will be coming an announcement. Um, by God's grace, after a long process, uh, we have hired an executive pastor, and he'll be joining us in about a week. And so the big reveal, you'll have to uh, look look. Look in your email for that, those of you that check that. And if you're not in our database, that's what the little cards in the seat back in front of you are for. If you choose to be Ron Swanson and continue to stay off the grid, that is entirely up to you. But you'll not know what's going on. Is that cool? Does that sound good? Sweet. If you have a Bible or a flat screen, I invite you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. We're getting back into our study as we've gone through Kings. But even before we get there, let me just say this. If you haven't been with us, uh, all of those sermons are online. If you like to play catch up, you know, you can, you can go back and listen to messages as you work out or commute or whatever. If you're not interested in that, or maybe you're kind of new to the Bible, I don't want you to feel lost today. Okay. We always go to the source first and I'll do my best to kind of, you know, give you the context. But even if you don't get it, I believe there's something here for everyone today. Not because of me but because God promises about his word that it does not return void. He also promises that his spirit is where two or three or more are gathered in his name. And so I'm just gonna say words, 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 but the thing that sticks, the one thing, I don't know all that other stuff he said, but that one thing, that's from God for you. Do you believe that? That's why we gather. That's why we gather. That's where the power is. It's not in us, it's not in all this, it's that God's here and that you've showed up today to hear from him and so we're gonna trust that that's gonna happen. So where we are in uh, 1 Kings chapter eight, uh, to put it in context, is the king of Israel, Solomon, has just completed the building of the temple. This had been promised that this would happen. His father, King David, had wanted to build the temple but God told him he could not, that instead it would be his son that would build the temple. And it's the end of a seven-year process that it took to build this temple. And they did everything with the best materials, the best craftsmen they possibly could to build a house for the name of the Lord. And the culmination of that is in 1 Kings chapter 8, where there's a big ribbon-cutting ceremony. Where, you know, Pastor Tim, before our Christmas series, we took a little break for Christmas, uh, he preached on the first... 10 verses of chapter eight. And, and what we saw there is this huge procession going to the temple where all of Israel was invited. 
And so I imagine in my mind's eye a crowd of hundreds of thousands, all the elders of all of the tribes, all of the leaders, all of the priests, all of their entourage, as many people as they could pack into that place. And the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant, this, this box that was a symbol of God's presence, and they placed it in the temple, a place where most people could never even go because it was too holy of a place and were sinful. Only the priests could go after a bunch of cleansing and, and so forth. And when the Ark of the Covenant went in, and this is important to where we're going today, it says the presence of the Lord filled the temple like a dark billowing cloud. That somehow this supernatural event that the whole place was just it's roiling with this cloud so dark, the priests could not do their duties. And so all of Israel standing there with Solomon kind of as the master of ceremonies here, and they're just watching this supernatural event take place where the dark cloud is just roiling out. And at this dedication, uh, this week and next week, we're gonna look at Solomon's prayer. And it's a long prayer. Solomon prays like my mom prays, okay? It just goes on for, like you fall asleep in the middle of it because she is a woman of prayer, right? And, and so there's a long prayer. So we've broken it up into two. So don't let the words distract you. We'll make some observations. And like I said, I believe there's something here for you. So with that as the backdrop, we're in 1 Kings chapter eight. And um, uh, we'll start in verse 12. God's word says, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen up in the place of David my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. This is God's word, and as I said, we'll cover the rest of his prayer next week, and I, and I hope you come back. But we've titled this message, A Royal Blessing, because that's how David begins. He begins with a royal blessing. But the first thing that he puts in context for the people is what's happening with this dark, billowing cloud that's filling the temple, and they can see it. Everybody's just kind of like, well, you know, drool coming out. What is happening, right? You know, and I know some of you wish that church had more like pyrotechnics, and, and we brought smoke machines and tried to manufacture that stuff. We're not going to do that. Okay, because in the new covenant with Jesus, we have his word. We don't need those things, or we shouldn't at least. But he puts it in context. And the first thing out of his mouth is the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. And what Solomon is alluding to is all through the Old Testament, we see this symbol of God's presence similar to a cloud. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. God never says in his word explicitly, I will dwell in thick darkness. But by his actions, he says he will dwell in thick darkness. And so Solomon is saying something true. And if you were an Israelite, you'd be reminded of their history. When they were first brought out of slavery and they, and they went through the wilderness, God met them on the mountain. At Mount Horeb, it says that they came to the base of the mountain and they were instructed not to go up, but only Moses could go up. 
And if you'll remember, I think this is in Exodus right around chapter 30, God's presence, is, well, sorry, first it's in 20, it, it, it envelops the top of the mountain and it's a dark, thick cloud. And it's not a rain cloud, it's not a diesel fire. Like, these people aren't dumb. They know, oh, this is for real. And it was a symbol of the presence of God. And the only one that could go up into God's presence was Moses because God called Moses up to do that. And so they would remember this God who dwells in thick darkness. Just a few chapters later in Exodus uh, chapter 33, uh, it's, it says that Moses was a man who spoke to God as a man speaks to a man face to face. Now let me clarify some things. Moses never saw God face to face. He wanted to. It says he spoke to him as a man speaks to a man face to face. It was a level of, of, of how close they were, what their communication was like. And God chose that to happen with Moses. But in Exodus 33, Moses wanted to see his face. And he says to God, show me your glory. And this is where God's response is, I, I can't do that because no one can see the Lord and live. No one can see God in all of his glory and live. Skeptics forever are like, oh, well, God, well, where is he? Bring him out here. He's not my pet. He's a for real God. And for us to see, according to God's word, for us to see him face to face, pow, you would die in that moment. But in Exodus 33, instead, God says, Moses, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll put my hand over that little opening and I will pass by and then I'll remove my hand and you can look at my back. What is this pointing to? Why, why is this important, John? Why do we talk about this cloud? It's a reminder for us, church, that God is transcendent. He's transcendent. That's a big fancy theological term for he is completely other than us. He is higher than you can ever imagine from us. The gap between us and God is unfathomable. He is exalted. He is majestic. His glory we can't even see. In my sin and my humanity and my mortality is less than a worm. That's forever why we're saying things like, listen, God's a for real God. He, he's, he's not your co-pilot. He's not your buddy. He's transcendent. And they're seeing a picture of the transcendence of God. It says um, in the book of uh, Psalms, or no, sorry, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 15. The prophet says, truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. God is transcendent. But don't forget the context. The context is they're dedicating a house that they've built for the Lord. God is transcendent, but he's also eminent. Now, that's not, for those of you that are nerding out the librarians in the root, it's not imminent, Imminent is something's about to happen, like the second coming of Jesus Christ. We say the imminent return of Jesus. That's imminent. This is eminent. This means this same God is so high and exalted that you could never even possibly reach him, also desires to be intimate and close and near to his people. The creator of all things desires to be with his creation that are made in his image. And so there's kind of this paradox that we see, the transcendence of God, and they see this cloud, but then at the same time, this is a God who they're building a house for. They're being obedient to build a house because it's a house for his name so he can be with his people. Paul says, in, in, or said in Acts chapter 17 in a sermon that he preached, is, is, he talks about the eminence of God. He says, in him we live and move and have our being. We just sang a song about it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Every breath that you have, every second that you have on this earth is a gift from God because it's in him and through him and by him that we live, we move, that we even exist. So we see his transcendence, we see his eminence. And then, just to recap the story, then because he's the master of ceremonies, 
uh, Solomon steps up there and it says, and he blessed the people. He blessed the people. And in this context, the blessing that we're talking about is he spoke words of goodness and kindness. He blessed the people and then he blessed God. Whenever we speak words of goodness or kindness to a friend, to a foe, to our children, to our spouse, we bless them. And it was appropriate for Solomon to bless the people, but he did so by blessing God. Because all it says in there is, and he blessed the people by saying, and then he starts talking to God. He blessed the people by blessing the source of all blessings. Reminding all of his hearers that it was God that made this happen. It was God that fulfilled his promise. It was God that made a way. It was God that told David this and he said that I should do it. He's drawing their attention to God. He blessed the people and he blessed God. And then the last thing I will draw your attention to is it's interesting. Whenever you see something in scripture, when you're reading it on your own, and hopefully you are, you're reading it in a group or with a family member or whatever, whenever you see something repeated, that's significant. Whenever you see something repeated, pay attention. And starting in verse 16, all the way to verse 20, he repeats a house for the name of the Lord five times. Once in every verse. In verse 17, he goes, it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of the Lord. In verse 18, he's, you know, God says to David, where you wanted to build a house for my name. And then in verse 19, he says, nevertheless, you will not build a house for my name. There's number three. In verse 20, uh, he says it again, that is a house for the name of the Lord. So five times he's talking about a house for the name of the Lord. No building can ever contain God. You couldn't build a building big enough. He's the creator we're the created, right? So the one who created space and time and matter, I can't possibly provide the space, time, and matter that could contain the creator of it, right? So just, you know, just for kicks and giggles, you know, when you have somebody that's a skeptic, it's like, oh yeah, if there's a God, who made God? Well, nobody, bozo. If somebody made God and he's not eternal, now he's not God, now is he? Whoever made him is God eminence and transcendence. But still, in his eminence, he wanted a house for his name. So this house housed the presence of the name of the Lord. But not just that. The last few verses, or the last verse that I read said it's also a place for the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, the only thing in it, and Pastor Tim covered this, you can look back, I believe it's in verse nine of chapter eight, it's, it, it was from the last message. The only thing in the Ark that was placed inside the temple were the stone tablets representing the very word of God. So this house is a place for the name, but it's also a place for God's word, a symbol of his promise, and a symbol of his fulfillment. That was front and center. So in this context, what does that mean for us? Thanks for the history lesson, pal. Glad you asked. You'll remember it's in Colossians chapter two, that's in the New Testament, that we're told everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. It's a, just a shadow. So all of this is pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to the gospel. It's pointing to the new life. It's not pointing to your perception of what Christians are. Because I'm gonna tell you, 2024, we got the worst press possible. We have the worst press than ISIS right now. Okay, all right? It's better to be a Muslim terrorist in this country than to be a Christian. How could you, right? Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. Everything that's come before is a shadow of what's meant to be. And so we look for those things that are for us through Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing. Here's the first thing. And by the way, I have three things because I am a preacher. <laughs> hey, yeah, great to hear from you. Monday morning. I got three things, right? I don't know. I, th I thought that was funny, but I'll keep trying. All right. 
Here's the first thing. You can know, you can know the eminent and transcendent God. You can know this eminent and transcendent God. Yes, it is a paradox. C.S. Lewis put it this way. God is both further away from you than you could possibly imagine, but he's also closer to you than you could possibly imagine, than more than any other being. Church, I don't know what you brought with you today. Whether you're here for the first time or the millionth time, I don't know what depression you've brought. I don't know if there's a struggle in your marriage. I don't know if there's a struggle with your kids or finances or health. I don't know if you're feeling lost and alone. I'm guessing somebody needed to hear today that you can know this God who is transcendent, but he's eminent as well. This is the desire of his heart is to be near us. Just in these past weeks, we've celebrated Christmas and we were reminded again of the words of the angel. You shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means God saves. So this transcendent God desires to come down and be near to us. You can't climb the ladder to God. Stop trying. You can't. That's human effort. It's religion. It's worthless. This transcendent God has to choose to be eminent. You shall call his name Jesus, and that's to fulfill the words of the prophet who said his name shall also be Emmanuel, which means God with us. What is the perfect picture of a God who is transcendent and eminent? Jesus. God transcendent with us. Jesus. That's the only way it can possibly happen. You know, if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. You know, his ministry, at least what's recorded, it takes about three years. And at the end of his ministry, at the Last Supper, he's giving final instructions to his small group, his fight club, the dudes that were closest to him. And they're starting to freak out because he's talking about going away and he's talking about being arrested and they're not quite sure. And in John chapter 14, I think it's Philip who speaks up and he says, because you know, th th one of his questions hasn't been answered yet. And he says to Jesus, uh, uh, Lord, show us the father. Show us God the father. Do you remember what his response was? I mean... It, Part of me wonders if, if Jesus, you know, in his humanity may have been a little discouraged by that. Really? You want to see the Father? You've walked on, or you've seen me walk on water. You've seen me calm a storm with just a word. You've seen me heal the lame, give sight to the blind, feed 5,000 or more people, not once, but at least twice with just a little sack lunch. You've seen me raise the dead. Show me the Father. Jesus responds to him, John 14, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. God in all his glory took on flesh and the transcendent God drew near to us through Jesus Christ. So the promise for us, yeah, this is a God who dwells in thick darkness. No one can see him and live. But he chose to take on flesh so he wouldn't just fall over dead. You want to know what God's like? You look at Jesus. Now think about that a minute. I, I, I just realized that, you know, I always love the last ser service, by the way, that we do have a Saturday night service. There's plenty of space. You know, that's for the people who want to come on Saturday night and just chill out on Sunday, right? And then we have an early service. There was space there too. But I assume that you're here because you know that there's no service after this so I can preach as long as I want, right? So you get the bonus material, right? You get the director's cut, is what you get at the 1030. Is, and now I forgot what I was gonna say. No. <laughs> is when we look at Jesus and how he drew near to people. You know, you think Jesus, you think God is a God that doesn't care about women? Jesus revolutionized women's rights. He appeared first to women. Women couldn't even bear testimony in court in the first century. You with your white patriarchy. Jesus 
spoke with them and taught them as equals in their value with men. Jesus spoke to Samaritans, people of different races, people that wanted to know the truth. He didn't care what their background was, how they identified. They got an audience with Jesus. You, no matter who you are, you can know this God who's transcendent, but he's also eminent. You can know him. You can know him. Here's the second thing. You can be a blessing to God and to people. You can be a blessing to God and to people. You don't have to wait. You can do it all on your own. If Solomon can bless people, you can bless people. If Solomon can speak words of kindness and goodness, or if he can speak out loud to God about, or talk to people about who God is, exalting him, that becomes a blessing to people, and he's blessing God. It's not a hard thing to do. And it's more than just saying, oh, God bless you when someone sneezes. Just last week, we had a spectacular sneeze right from the second row. It was so spectacular, I had to say God bless you from the stage. I had to, because it was spectacular. It was amazing. It was like a soprano octave whatever, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we speak goodness to one another, when we speak blessing to one another. And it's in speaking, but it's also in doing. Some of us are in situations or in relationships where they're falling apart and we wonder why. Have you ever spoken blessing into that? What do I mean by blessing? It's not some holy kind of, you know, get you a cross and a smoke and some oil and you're like, oh. No, it's just, have you told your kid you love them? Have you told your kid you're proud of them? Have you told your wife or your husband that you appreciate them? Those are words of blessing. We can bless God that way as well which might sound counterintuitive because God is a perfect being. Part of his nature is he's perfect and part of God's nature is also that he's simple. Simple meaning you can add nothing to God nor can you take anything away from God. I am not simple. You are not simple. I'm not simple, you could just ask my wife. She never knows what mood this jack wagon's gonna be in, right? You could take something away and I'm in a bad mood for a week. Silent treatment, right? But with God, you can't do that. You can't add anything, nor can you take anything away from him. But you can bless God. And the blessing is when you speak the truth about who he is. That's all Solomon was doing in his prayer. God, you're the God that brought us out of Egypt. God, you said we'll build a house for your name. God, you told my father it wouldn't be him, but it would be me, and now we've built this house. He's speaking about the goodness and the kindness and the faithfulness of God. You can do that too. You can be a blessing to God and to people. You can do it with your words. You can do it with your actions. Just this past Christmas, I... Uh, was sitting with our family right before Christmas dinner. And because I'm a nerd and I'm always like thinking a couple sermons ahead, I watched my father-in-law play the role of Solomon. And he stood up before the dinner began and he blessed his family by simply saying how much he loved them. And then he blessed us again by blessing the food. He blessed God. And I'm all over there going, oh, he's just like Solomon. Solomon. Bless the people and bless God. Do you know when people at your work or at your school or the people you hang out with or your spouse, your kids, when they hear you bless God, it becomes a blessing to them? Some of us are scared to death to talk about God. We'll never bless God and therefore we're never gonna bless people. But the blessing is with our words, it's also with our actions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're instructed, if you're a Christian, listen, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, if you think about that, and words matter, you can look up the verse. He says, eat or drink to put it in the context of your everyday life. Bro, that's you at the shop. That's you at lunch with your girlfriends. That's you sitting around uh, tomorrow night watching Michigan crush Washington for the glory of God. <laughs> Whatever you do, well, whatever, whatever is whatever, it's everything. 
in your playtime, in your work time, in your downtime, when people are watching, when they're not watching. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And when you do that, you're a blessing to God. It's the same way a small child that brings you, we've, we've mentioned this before, it's the easiest illustration. Small child brings you something that they have made. And the younger the child, the worse the artwork. <laughs> right? Look what I made you. Now you can imagine God is up there going, how could you? You can't even color in the lines. You're three, you're my kid, get after it. Right? No. <laughs> if it's just scribble scra- scrabble. I mean, maybe because I'm a... I'm a you know, I'm a grandfather now. Those things are precious. Those things get framed, right? Because yeah, the gap between ability is massive, but it doesn't matter. She was blessing me. She was blessing me. I don't know where that cookie is that you just made for me, but because it's from you, I'll put it in my mouth, cat hair and all. <laughs> God knows his children. He knows our hearts. And anything we try to do in our everyday lives, we're called to be a blessing for God. It's for the glory of God. I was just coming into the service today and a young lady who I've had the privilege of uh, of being a coach for, um, uh, she's in a different sport right now and she just came up to me. You know what she was so excited? To tell me, hey, hey, listen. And by the way, don't sell us out. So don't repeat this, okay? Please don't repeat this outside the walls. I don't wanna get in trouble with the public school. (laughs) But she comes up and she goes, hey, Uh, I think I'm gonna get my middle school basketball team to start praying before games. And and she was telling me how she was gonna do it. And I'm I'm sitting there, yes, because if a student leads it, bingo. Now you could say, oh, well, then that's whatever. You know what that is? That is more guts and more courage than the majority of the men in our church. Mic drop. And I didn't say that to hurt you. I said that to challenge you. You can be a blessing to God. You can be a blessing to people. Think about how many lost people there are still in Northern Michigan. This is a real question, answer yes or no. Are there lost people in Northern Michigan? Do you know any lost people in Northern Michigan? Great, what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do about it? Men that don't know how to read the Bible because they've never been in a fight club because no one's ever dragged them there. Last night at the, at the service, I said I was born and raised in the Christian ghetto and uh, uh, an old soul came up to me and he goes, you were born and raised in the Christian ghetto? I was born and raised in a druggy church. I said, druggy church? He said, yeah, I was drugged there. <laughs> I like it, I'm keeping that one. Put that in the arsenal, right? Sometimes you need to drag somebody here to get him here. Because this is life. And how can you bless God and bless people by loving your family well, by leading your family well? How can you bless God and bless people by saying, you know what, there's a place. How can you bless God and bless people by saying, you know what, in Cadillac, I can serve. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm passionate about kids' men. Who cares if you're passionate or not? We got jobs to do in Cadillac. It's kind of like Tom Hanks and Saving Private Ryan. Who's going left? Well, I'm not sure that I'm called to do cafe in Cadillac. Someone's got to dish out the coffee. When my children, yeah, thank you. (laughs) When my children were born, I didn't feel called to diapers, but the diapers needed to get done. (laughs) Sometimes you just do your duty. Sorry about the rant. You can be a blessing to God and to people. And here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. You, if you're Christian, and even if you're not, you're called to be, You are a dwelling for God's name and his word. You, your life, your heart, your soul. You're a dwelling for God's name and his word. Remember, Colossians chapter two, the things of old are a shadow of the things to come. So what do we learn in just the last few minutes from the New Testament? When Jesus came, God in flesh, the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us, he told his opponents, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And he said that in the temple grounds, hundreds of years later. Now it wasn't the same temple, it was the temple 3.0. Solomon's temple eventually gets destroyed. And then they did a little rebuild and then that one got destroyed too. And so the third iteration of the temple, Jesus is standing there and he says to a bunch of religious people, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. 
And they actually used that at his trial because they didn't know what he was talking about. They thought he was talking about a temple built by human hands, which the scripture also says God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. His name can dwell there, but God doesn't dwell there. For real, he's transcendent. Jesus was talking about the temple of himself, the temple of his body. Speaking of the fact that he would be crucified and three days later he would defeat Satan, sin and death by coming back to life so that I can have life, so that you can have life. So Jesus is the temple. So this temple is a shadow of the Jesus temple. Did Jesus bear the name of God? Yes. His name was God saves. His name was God with us. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Ancient of Days, God in flesh. Jesus was a dwelling place for the name of the Lord. If you wanna look at Jesus, you're looking at God. Jesus was also the Word. So Jesus was a dwelling for God's name and his Word because he was the Word. The beginning of John, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh. He embodied the Word. When we study this, it's not to try to turn people into nerds. It's, this is our representation and our understanding of the word revealing himself to us. You want to know what Jesus is like? You need to get in here. So Jesus was a temple. But you keep going a little bit further. The New Testament also teaches that the church is his temple. That we are a dwelling place for his name and his word. He says, Paul in his letters in his epistles says, you are the temple. This church, any church, is a bearer of the name. That's why, look, I love the tabernacle. And and we just, you know, we just became an evangelical free church. But I don't care if your church is evangelical free, reformed, if it's, if, if it's a, a Methodist, if it's Wesleyan, if it's Nazarene, if it's a, a Baptist, First Baptist, Second Baptist, Free Baptist, Locked Up Baptist, all the Baptists, if you're a Quaker baker, candlestick maker, I, I, I gotta say it, you know, it's just part of the stick, right? Churches, if you bear the name of Jesus, that's all I really care about. Do you bear his name? Is his name on you? That's why forever at this church, we're trying to tell people, say his name. Everyone's okay with God as long as you don't identify who your God is. Rappers, rock stars, total pagans will get their award and, you know, I just want to thank God for making me so beautiful and intelligent and my agent and blah, 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 blah. But when someone speaks the name Jesus, they think we're straight crazy because that's who God is. Don't ever be ashamed of the name. And our church is called to be bearers of God's name. This is a Jesus church, yes? Yes? But it's not just a bearer of the name. We're not just a place to speak the name of Jesus. We're also a dwelling for his word. Why is the tabernacle on and on and on about the Bible? I mean, why do we have to go 47 weeks through 1 Kings? Why can't we do a topical series on, you know, how to make me feel better? Or why can't we do a three-week series on spring colors that John got out of good housekeeping? You know, here's our spring colors. Um, you might want to try lipsticks in these hues. I mean, we're not going to be that kind of church. <laughs> if it doesn't come out of here, it's just words. But if it comes from God's word, it's got power. Man, I'm worked up today. I'm sorry. So Jesus is a dwelling for God's name and his word. The church is a dwelling for God's name and his word. And you know what, Christian? You are a dwelling for God's name in his word, because the New Testament also says you are a temple. Your body is a temple. When you become a child of God, you're adopted as a child of God, and you take his name. You represent Christ, whether you like it or not. You're a dwelling place for his name. Does his name rule in you? Do other people know that his name rules in you? Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs God everything, his one and only son, so that you could wear the name. And I've shared this before, one of the most powerful parenting things my father ever did for me. Maybe it won't work with your kid, maybe it won't work with mine. But I remember, you know, teenager, I'm going out with the boys on a Friday night, 
and, 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 you know, my dad was a pastor of one of the larger churches in town and, and, you know, everybody knew who my dad was. And so they all know who his kid is and I'm going out with the boys and he's like, Hey, what time are you coming back? I was like, I don't know, probably one or two. He goes, how about 12? Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, I'll be back by 12. And as I'm heading out, he goes, Hey, one more thing. Remember who you are. It wasn't a threat. It was a reminder because I love my dad because I bear his name and I bear all that his name represents, that he's a follower of Jesus, that he's a servant of Christ, that he's leading that church. And it was just a little subtle reminder when you're out and about town, whatever you're about to do, and I'm sure he knew we were up to shenanigans, you know, remember you bear my name. Church, can I tell you something? If you're a Christian, you bear his name. You bear his name. Now, you can't earn God's good graces. He's already loved us and died for us. The scripture says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But you know what? It cost him so much. I'm called to live my life in response. The third commandment, commandment number three, is you shall not profane the name of the Lord your God. Listen carefully. Some of us have reduced commandment number three. Well, as long as you don't, you know, use God's name in a profane way if you, you know, hit your finger with a hammer. You know, if you don't say Jesus Christ really loud or God whatever, you know, then that's profane. No, it's way more than that. If you are a bearer of the name, any time you sin in thought, word, or deed, that is profaning the name of God because you bear his name. If Jesus ever sinned, which he never did, but if he did, he wouldn't be qualified to be the son of God because he bore the name. You and I are called to bear his name, to be a dwelling place for his name and not to profane it. And we're called to be people of the word. I don't know what your resolutions are, but if one of them isn't to be a man or a woman or a young man or a young woman, if, 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 if the word is nowhere in your resolutions, throw all of them out and add it. Somewhere on the list of lose weight, be kinder, you know, have more time with family, blah, blah, freaking blah. Be men and women of the word and all of that takes care of itself. When we ingest it, when we listen to it, when we hear it, when we study it, we're called to be a dwelling place for the word. The same way the ark found a place in that temple, the same way that Jesus embodied the word, the same way at a church the word is supposed to be central. My question, is the word central to you and your life? How do we pull all these threads together? I'm glad you asked. One place in Colossians. So if you have a Bible, flip over there real quick. Or if you're going on your flat screen, just keep it on mute. You know what I'm talking about? That guy, that's all of a sudden, his little Bible talker starts talking in the middle of church. For God so loved Lord. And he's like, oh, son of a God. Yeah. <laughs> mute it. Colossians 3 ties it all together. Verse 15. He says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. The peace of Christ can only happen by knowing the eminent and transcendent God. You can only have peace with God by knowing Jesus. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything we've talked about is present in those verses, that you can know this eminent and transcendent God and have the peace of Christ, that you can be a blessing to God and to people in the whatever you do in word or deed. If you do everything in the name, there's the name that dwells in you, the name that you're called to be about and his word 
that's to dwell in you richly. How does this all come together in a person, in a name, in the word, in the eminent, in the transcendent, the ultimate blessing, and that is Jesus. It's in Jesus. He ties it all together. If you don't know anything we've talked about today, you need to know Jesus. If you don't bear his name, you can bear his name today. You can ask Christ into your life if you've never done it before. If you've been far away for a long time, you can draw near. The scripture says, if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. God hasn't moved, you have. God hasn't moved, you have. Draw close to him. And I can't guarantee you'll see some billowing cloud of smoke, but I know what we see in Jesus is much more beautiful. You wanna know what God's like? Look at Jesus. You wanna know God? Get to know Jesus. That can happen. I'm fired up, 2024. Bands are gonna come. If you'll bow your heads, we're gonna gonna sing some more, but I wanna pray, and I I wanna create a space for you to process What was the one thing, what was the one thing for you that you heard God say loud and clear? Maybe you're super smart, you're a note taker and you got 15 things, but for most of us, we come in here with a cup of coffee and just a hope that God will speak. What was the one thing? What are you gonna do about that one thing? Because if it was just a laugh or just an entertainment or just knowledge or a good reminder, okay, what are you gonna do about it? Tell God. And if you don't know, ask him. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for sending your son as the word, the word in flesh. Thank you that it is true and it is trustworthy. Thank you, God, that you're a God with mystery in your transcendence. But thank you, God, so much that in your eminence that you draw near, that you promised that you are closer than a brother. God, I pray that you would show us how to speak blessing to you and in doing so to bless others. God, I pray that you would show us in little ways, practical ways, how to be a blessing to you and to others and to stop just looking for blessing for ourselves but to become conduits of blessing. God, would you help us to be men and women called to bear your name and that your word would dwell in us richly, that we would be committed to that, not in some legalistic way, but in a way that invites the eminent and transcendent God into our everyday lives. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, I pray with all my heart that they would make a decision to follow you today. For those that have been far away, God, I pray that you will reignite that relationship. And God, for all of us, that we would be your obedient servants, that we would bless you, and that you would continue to make us as individuals and as a church a blessing the way you've blessed us. God, I ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
good to be here together. You guys worship oh, so beautifully today. Thank you so much. Uh, you are so deeply loved. I hope you know that. Don't forget our prayer team are over there in that corner. They would love to pray with you, over you, and for you. So take care. We love you. See you next week.